Thank you, Rufo. Thank you, everyone. Uh, well, um, trust is key. And you invited a lawyer and a Swiss lawyer to discuss about trust in this ecosystem. So that's already a challenge. Um, uh, I'm here to, to, to try and discuss a little bit with you how a rational lawyer and attorney would perceive the numerous challenges that there are uh, with regard to the question that is asked today. Can, be, can we be safe and free in the cyberspace? And of course, there are many other challenges than legal challenges, technical challenges, financial challenges, societal ch challenges. Focusing on the legal part, the main challenge is, of course, to make sure that what our funding texts include, i.e. the right to privacy, is fully respected in the online world. And the right to privacy, if I try to translate it into more technical terms, I would think of it as a right to use, freely use, end-to-end -end encryption. So when I say end-to-end -end encryption, Rufo, for me, it means only Alice and Bob in the same room, no Carol, no mother-in-law, no uncle, whosoever. So just Alice and Bob, and only Alice and Bob, knowing that the other one is in the room and discussing. So no third-party intervention. That's my definition of end-to-end -end encryption for the purposes of this presentation. So no key shared by and with a third party, except, of course, the recipient. Um, now, this being safe from surveillance, the right to privacy, this being free to express one's opinion, maybe anonymously, as certain people argue, needs to be balanced, of course, in comparison with what is also required, the legitimate investigative powers of at least democratic states. And the question is how to really balance that. And you will see that the laws currently do not operate that balance. So what can already be said is that clearly the answer to the question of this reconciliation and that necessary balance between the right to privacy and the necessity to investigate crimes, this balance cannot be achieved through the enactment or the implementation of very broad mass surveillance laws as it has been the case in recent years. The first attempt by le the legislators to try and address this balance was either to do nothing, it's better not to have a law and do it behind the doors, or for the most honest governments, enact a law, but that basically if you read the law, it does not bring you any answer uncertainty. It brings more uncertainties because you have no clue as to how the law will be implemented, how it will be enforced, no oversight, no transparency, no accountability. If I leave the mass surveillance laws aside and I try to focus more about what could the police do in targeted surveillance or in connection with a very specific individual investigation, then you have more detailed legal provisions around European states. But if you look very uh, carefully at these provisions, there are not so many that provide you the right criteria and most of them fail the test of providing specific offenses, specific process, and especially proper oversight. There are other legal issues that, of course, would be worth discussing, one of which is the jurisdictional reach of court orders and how countries could, through their law, basically influence what is going on across the border and how to expand surveillance to other countries. But I suppose this will not be uh, something that we will discuss at least now, maybe in the panel. So the good news. The good news is that it seems that on the paper, at least officially, we're at a point in time now where there is a broad consensus, maybe the broadest consensus ever, to recognize and acknowledge a basic universal human right to encrypt. When I say right to encrypt, for me it's the right to privacy, the right to Encrypt private communication, not have this communication accessed whatsoever by whoever else than Alice or Bob, okay? We are at this point in time where we are back at the table discussing about the right to privacy, the right to intercept, but with a broad consensus that now in 2015, the right to privacy, the right to encrypt should prevail. And as a proof of this, of this momentum that I, I feel, 
I would, uh, oh, sorry, I would mention a UN report of May of, of, of this year. I would mention a European report of June of this year. I would even be tempted to um, quote a uh, written submission by the United States to the Special Rapporteur at the UN, basically putting in writing the official position of the United States regarding encryption. And if you read that, you have the US firmly supporting the robust adoption of strong encryption. Strong encryption is not defined, though. But nevertheless, you have that in writing. What is, I think, more interesting is that behind what is the official stance, you had last week, maybe some of you saw that, a leaked, uh, a leaked uh, internal memo leaked by the Washington Post of a July meeting or a July position paper by the, the National Security Council that basically said that there is no way that whatever the policy options are for the US, they could come forward and propose new legislation that would further restrict the right to encrypt. So, it means that the worst case scenario from a legal perspective is the status quo. And for me, it is still good news. It could be worse. You could have official positions leaked to the press that basically try and get more aggressive hands by the governments on individual freedoms. The worst case seems to be right now status quo. And for me, this is good news. It could have been worse. So this basic universal right to encrypt is something that is broadly a knowledge and we should try and seize the momentum. Now, of course, what is also a knowledge is that this wonderful right to encrypt is subject to certain limitations. And this is where we have an issue from a legal perspective because the conditions, if you really try to look one state law after the other and really try and assess what are the common criteria for any government to try and restrict this right to encrypt, you end up with very different lists. So if, if we try to find what are the cumulative conditions for any attempt by a legislator to restrict a right to encrypt, so the basic right to privacy, you end up with certain conditions such as lawfulness. There should be, there shall be a legal provision detailing what is supposed to be done. You can't just have your uh, interception on your, of your access out of the blue or based on a constitutional power. You need a very specific and detailed legal provision detailing how access will be mandated under which conditions. Then you need necessity, meaning that the reason why you are trying to harm the basic right to privacy is because there is a greater good somewhere that you try to protect. But the way it is phrased, it is worded in different laws, basically it's you know, the general interest of the society or the economic well-being of, of the UK. I'm very interested in the economic well-being of the UK and I don't wish them that they can't achieve that goal. But of course, this is the provision that is in the current UK implementation uh, uh, provisions. The well, economic well-being of the UK is a reason why you would be able, for example, to intercept private communications. Third, criteria, proportionality. And this is where most of the provisions fail. Proportionality means basically that if you try, what you try to achieve would lead to decryption of much more than is needed because the pair of keys does not basically, is not limited to the actual communication you are entitled to, cert, to, to, to put surveillance on, but by getting the decryption key, you have access to all the history of the communications between these two people because there is no forward secrecy um, algorithm in place, then it is not proportionate because there is a huge potential for abuse by the government. By applying this measure, they are getting much more information that was is proportionate to what is sought in the current investigation. And fourth, and I think this criteria will become more and more uh, interesting, adequacy. Adequacy meaning that there is no use trying to find and put a notice or a subpoena or a warrant against the provider if the provider does not have any valuable information to share. And, and what we see more and more, I can't tell about first-hand experience in Europe. I can tell you about first-hand first -hand experience in Switzerland with Swiss clients and law enforcement requests. Uh, 
many requests from prosecution offices come on the desk of my clients and with just an explanation from my clients as to how technically what they seek will not be effective because they are targeting the wrong person because the client, the provider, does not have the keys, will also help you know, raise awareness on the prosecution side as to what is adequate in terms of surveillance. I have the feeling that, at least in Switzerland, in certain regions, the police is not aware of what they are trying to think. You know, you have a judge signing an order, and then the police, the officers trying to enforce that order, realize when you discuss with them that the intended measure for surveillance will not be adequate. So it's not even a question of challenging it or not. Even if it is successful, they won't get the information that they are seeking. And, and this is something that I've realized maybe in Europe too, meaning that adequacy should be one of the conditions. You can't implement a measure, you can't have a court sign on a measure, a surveillance measure or an intercept measure if that measure, even if successful, will not reach the targeted purposes. Now what is interesting, and uh, that's maybe my role as a lawyer, is that the checks and balances have not come, at least in Europe, have not originated from the parliament. They have not originated from uh, the, the, the legislation bodies. The courts help. The courts being, of course, seized by citizens most of the time, helped put some guidance as to what was acceptable or not. And that was the case in Germany in 2008. The situation is not resolved. That was the case, of course, you have heard about the invalidation of the data retention uh, directive in the EU and yesterday we had an advocate general asking very good questions and recommending that someone has a close look at the safe harbor agreement between the EU and the USA. So the courts are doing their job. I do have only three minutes. Yeah. Four, good. <laughs> that is a slide, that is, I'm negotiating, that is a slide, that is a slide that basically sh tries to show that it's a much broader picture, okay? There are several ways of trying to attempt to limit individual rights, okay? I have taken one angle, but there are many other possibilities. The good news for us in Europe is that many of these potential restrictions are not applicable in, in, in Europe. You don't have restrictions on, on R&D, you don't have restrictions on end users in Europe. But I'm thinking here as a Swiss or as an EU lawyer. I'm not thinking for the rest of the world, and maybe this is you know, global approach should require that. But what is the key issue for EU-wide system is the existence and the persistence in different countries of very strong mandatory disclosure laws. So the situation is as follows. Either you have no specific mention in the laws of what should be done in case the police has an encrypted material it has access to. And, you know, sometimes the police will consider yeah, that's fine, we can do it. We can find someone maybe who could decrypt that and we're going to impose our power to do that. Some other countries have really tried to, tack to, to address the specific issue of encrypted material that should be decrypted for the purposes of enforcing the law. That is the case for the UK, that is the case for France, Belgium in particular, and Spain. And what we see in these few countries, so there is no EU-wide legislation, what we see in these few countries is that the criteria are extremely broad. And, and in the UK, for example, you have 12 pages of provisions. So it's very detailed when you look at that 12 pages as to what is the process to follow, which persons are authorized to access encrypted material, how can we enforce an order regarding that. But after the 12 pages, you don't know a clue because it's so broadly written that everybody basically could abuse the system if that person would like to abuse the system without any accountability. So the point, two slides, the point is that in Europe, my personal assessment right now as we speak in September 2015 is full of good news. Here are the, the challenges and this is what has already been done satisfactorily. This is what still needs to be done. So the good news is that there is no limitation on the right to encrypt as such you are free to encrypt your private communication in Europe. I mean, that's already an achievement. Okay, let's try and be positive and optimistic. 
What is missing is that there is also no affirmative support for end-to-end -end encryption. So how do you interpret this silence? Is it that we tolerate the fact that people could use encryption, but there is no strong explicit support for that? What is fun also is that, to my knowledge, there is no regulatory restriction on the research or the use of encrypted material. Now, of course, there are issues regarding export control, but these are not EU domestic. Export control, Vassanar arrangements, there are, of course, there is work to do, but that's more about EU and the rest of the world. There is, to my knowledge, no official surveillance mechanism EU-wide. Each country tries to play uh, its part in that, and they are doing it very efficiently, but there is no EU-wide mechanism in place with common criteria. There are uncertainties with regard to conditions to lawful access. You have to go down deep into each country's legal system to understand from the criminal code provisions what is acceptable for in case of which investigation and what could be retrieved for information, can, what can be ordered against whom. And there is the persistence of several mandatory key disclosure laws, and this is a real issue because basically it's no use trying to secure and feel being safe and being free while you can have any police officer basically with any court order or any warrant coming and extracting the information that was supposed to be protected because the laws are so broad. The way forward, so two calls here. I think there is a need from a legal perspective not only to keep silent about encryption, but to actively and explicitly support end-to-end -end encryption, maybe with Rufo's definition, it's not 12 pages, but it's six pages already your definition, but a very strong and explicit support for encryption as one way of dealing and implementing this right to privacy that is very broadly understood right now. Second, there should be a systematic review of existing legislation with criteria that needs to be basically used and un understood and applied and implemented across the board, across all 28 or more nations and Switzerland. And these, these criteria should be known and should be predictable. Uh, proportionality, specificity, adequacy. There is this discussion about proper oversight that is totally missing. And um, there should be a, a, a specific focus on the mandatory key disclosure laws that persist and that are in existence in Europe. Regarding companies, proactively disclosing vulnerabilities, I think this is extremely important, but we would need the legislation, and I'm a promoter of open source, so I like codes to show better quality. What is missing here is basically two more calls. Calls on citizen to citizens to seize the courts. We see that there is a push, there is pressure on the providers, there is pressure on the system when citizens seize the courts. The courts respond to requests by citizens. And I would say that for once, the European courts seem to be much more engaged in the debate rather than the US courts. And finally, a call on every and each of you to be responsible because the best way to protect your privacy is not to publish anything, <laughs> not to exchange anything. Uh, be it with Alice or be it with Bob. A and we have, on an individual basis, also our role to play to enhance the ecosystem. Stop sharing everything. Thank you, Rufo. <laughs>